As we talked this morning, um, I thought about, I thought that what would be appropriate to share with you is kind of where I came from and who are my role models and how I became an astronaut and what we do as an astronaut so that you can see why general math and general science and a, a knowledge for all of our students is really important and why um, I may have been lucky a little bit because my mom was a math teacher so I may have had someone always pushing in my corner and always inspiring me but why you guys also make the difference along the way because it wasn't just my mom and dad that got me on this route it was a bunch of teachers and I'll talk a little bit more about them so how I became an astronaut um, is going to lead into what you guys do on a daily basis. Well, first of all, it starts off back in the 80s when the, um, when the shuttle was just starting to fly. And while the Russians had already flown two women before Sally Ride, um, Sally Ride would fly when I was in the third grade. And third grade tends to be one of those mile markers along the way in a student's journey when um, things start to click, that they start to make plans. Well, there's my third grade art project. You think I wasn't paying attention to what was going on in uh, the news, you don't, and my parents were telling me stuff, and guess what? My teachers were letting us watch shuttle launches because it was the beginning of a new program. And then in sixth grade, that's the um, upper left-hand corner, um, we would have uh, Challenger, the Challenger accident. And it was just as I was going from a class that my, um, one of our really good teachers and, uh, and a good friend of our family uh, said, we we're going to have to turn you guys around. You know, the, the shuttle did not make it into space. We're not going to be able to watch this. And I went home and I talked with my mom about risk because I just lost my grandmother and, uh, to cancer the year before. And, it, and I wondered about, I guess, death, and I wondered about what we do in our life with purpose. And it seemed to me that that whole crew had a lot of purpose and that we could still learn, and we do still learn from what happened there. And we took those lessons about how to make the shuttle safer, and we also took those lessons that exploration is worth it. Went on to middle school, and again, like I said, my mom is a, was a math teacher, and my dad was a science teacher for five years before going off to work at Hewlett Packard. And so uh, always, all of our family vacations, whenever we packed up the car, because at that time you still packed up cars, you know, and drove around, <laughs> and uh, everything was always full of learning. We were always at a museum, at a planetarium, going to the Grand Canyon. I grew up in Colorado, so there's a lot of mountains and inspiring night skies there um, and so we were always on the go but in middle school again another big step along a student's journey uh, probably one of the more crucial places when kids are actually deciding what they're gonna their path is gonna be in high school and then high school is gonna maybe take them on to college or to a different route but in middle school Mr. Jordan saw that I had some talent. He was my seventh grade general science, you know, we're learning about just the basics of everything, nothing very glorious, um, nothing that you're going to write papers about. But Mr. Jordan saw that I was very good at math and that I liked science class. I didn't know a lot about it, um, but I was always working hard, always had questions, coming to class prepared, you know, and uh, he invited me to join the math um, Engineering Science Applied Club, or MESA, and I don't know they, if you guys have it in the area, but um, so I became involved in that, and at the end of eighth grade, he had, um, in one of our science classes with him, we had taken his food garbage, and we had cooked it in a crock pot, and we had put some yeast in, and we distilled what the yeast produced, and basically we met, made ethanol in his classroom, <laughs> and we ran his lawnmower off of it. Then, and you know, and you guys are teachers, so you know you have those second jobs sometimes in the summers, and Mr. Jordan was, um, he mowed lawns in the summer to make a go. And so we powered his lawnmower, but we did a lot of good science along the way. Well, anyway, that science that we did in eighth grade, he asked me to join Terrence. The two of us went and out to California, and we presented to teachers. 
and to businessmen um, basically about what Mesa was and about what we were learning. And that's when I realized I have a knack for science and I like it and I want to go on and do it. So thanks a lot to Mr. Jordan. And I invited him to my launch. Unfortunately, launches are unpredictable. And I was supposed to launch in March, and he had it all worked out because his son is now going off to college. And, and, uh, but he couldn't do the April launch date. So I didn't get to have Mr. Jordan at my launch, but I did have my third grade teacher at my launch. And of course, my parents and a couple of my high school teachers. So let's go on to um, well, almost to high school. Just before I went to high school, my sister's elementary school teachers knew that I was interested in space because I have a lot of passions and apparently, you know, my parents talked a lot. And anyway, her teacher knew about a contest in Colorado and said, um, hey, you might want to mention this to your sister. Uh, it's a writing contest. And I know she's interested in space camp. Maybe she'll apply. So I wrote an essay and I took second place. And second place got me a t-shirt from NASA. And first place was a free trip to space camp. But again, my parents believed in me. And this is the advantage I had of being in a middle class home that sometimes um, it's really good that we offer scholarships and we offer opportunities to those who do not come from middle class or upper class. Because my parents were able to pay to send me to space camp. And it wasn't easy, but they scraped together the money and they sent me. But we need to have in place those scholarships or those benefits so that all kids could have this opportunity, all kids that have these types of dreams. So anyway, I went to space camp for a week in ninth grade, April of 1990. So 20 years later, I would sit in a shuttle in the same month that I went to space camp. And the shuttle, this is just how like weird things kind of happen sometimes. But I left and I built a model shuttle and the shuttle that I built was Discovery and we were on the last returnable trip of Discovery. Discovery will launch this time and return to Earth but it will be its final mission and we were the last time that it went and came back as a to be used again vehicle. So April 1990 was also when Hubble would be launched at the end of that month. And boy, did Hubble tell us a whole lot about our universe. And uh, so it was just kind of a cool time. Just lucky that I was there. Well, on to high school. Mr. Lunt was able to make it to my launch. Mr. Lunt was my science Olympiad coach and my chemistry teacher in high school, as well as a cross-country mentor. Uh, you know, we, uh, as teachers, we all have these different hats. And so you, um, that's probably another way that you inspire your students, as you let them see that you do a lot of different things, that you're a parent or that you're, you know, an artist or a photographer or a runner or whatever else you do because kids may not connect in your class, but they may connect to something else that you do. Well, Mr. Jordan also used to, um, you know, MacGyver was big back then. Every test was either MacGyver getting rid of some bomb or Calvin and Hobbes getting themselves out of some sort of trouble. So again, making your class relevant and funny and interesting and relatable to your students, always important. And then I went on to college, and as I said, I um, studied geology, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it was what got me outdoors. I love being outdoors and hiking. I spent one summer outside of Yellowstone avoiding bears and mapping the last glaciation there. And then I spent another summer in southern Colorado mapping 2.5 billion-year-old rocks. So geology was my passion, and someday I hope we go to either the moon or to Mars, and we're talking about an asteroid too. All of those would be very interesting to a geologist, so um, I'd love it. In the meantime, my support group, I've talked to you about how my parents were teachers. My whole family is full of teachers. There was never a doubt in my mind that at some point in my life I would be teaching. Uh, my grandmothers, my aunts, uncles, cousins, husband, sister who's there in her mask were right there at the beach before I launched to space and she had a little bit of a allergy and they you know we're worried about germs so she had to cover up but that's right before we launched into space and hopefully my daughter will someday be whatever she wants to be but I am a, a mother of a three and a half year old and uh, right in the upper left that is a telescope that I built with Jason my husband um, when I was a teacher 
I taught high school for five years in the Vancouver Public School District in Vancouver, Washington. It's an inner urban school, um, Title I school, and I saw a lot of things in teaching, a lot of things I didn't see when I was growing up in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so one of the things that my students didn't ever do was look at the night sky. And I was an astronomy teacher, and I was like, this is such a shame. How can you not look up at the very beautiful stars, and how have you never looked through a telescope? So I got this opportunity to build this telescope with John Dobson, who created this type of mount, which is very easy and very unintimidating. And I think that's what a lot of our students worry about with science, is that sometimes it can be intimidating. The equipment is much different than the equipment in your household. And um, the people that do it, sometimes they speak in this language that our kids don't always get right away. You know, numbers are easy for some people, and numbers are not as easy for other people. A daughter of a mathematician, I was the daughter that it wasn't always as easy for me to get math, but my sister, who is a math teacher in Chicago, was just rattling off the numbers. You know, you have to make it where my mom taught me a bunch of little tricks so that it was easier for me, so that I could keep up with my little sister. Um, and so this telescope, I used it with my students, there's nothing intimidating about it because it's all built from scraps. The, the most expensive thing on it is a mirror. The mirror at the bottom I ground with my husband by hand and then we got it coated. But uh, it's just a proform tube that I covered with a bunch of uh, pretty painting. And um, the bottom of it is plywood and it's so easy to point wherever you want. And the kids would come, of course I bribed them at first, <laughs> with donuts or pizza, but the kids would become before or after school and I'd show them the planets, the um, nebula, and then just let them pick out whatever they wanted to look at. The crescent moon is really beautiful. Even in the daylight we could take it out during class and look at the moon and um, just get them looking and thinking ab above and beyond the classroom in Vancouver, Washington. Well, I was also a coach. I ran cross country in college, and um, I still, as you heard, I still run um, a lot, and I enjoy it. And this is my cross country team, and this is the last astronomy class that I taught when I was in Vancouver. So, <laughs> I guess you guys have heard about the potty on the shuttle. Well, how did a high school teacher become an astronaut. A lot of people want to know because it's not the normal path to becoming an astronaut. Usually you're an astrophysicist or you're a pilot or you know, you've taken a lot different route. Well, um, one of my students, I don't even think this student necessarily graduated from high school, which always discourages me, but one of my students in my astronomy class asked, how do you go to the bathroom in space? And I knew I had some sort of suction to it, but I didn't know what the toilet looked like. And it's a valid question. It's a really important engineering question. If we can't figure it out, then we couldn't have gone to space, or we'd always be wearing diapers, which is just really not viable in a waste situation. So um, I went and looked it up on the internet, and it took me to the NASA website. They had a little v short video demonstration of the shuttle toilet, but, but to, um, that answered her question. What answered my question in life was that they had the opportunity for high school and uh, middle school teachers with a science or engineering background to apply to become an astronaut in the class of 2004. And so I went and told my husband, this is the perfect opportunity, I have to apply. This is the job I've always wanted. And he said, you know, statistically, you are not going to get that job. And I said, I know, but if I don't try, <laughs> I'll never get the job. So I still applied and uh, defied Jason's statistics <laughs> and got the job. And here's the class of 2004. And all of us, which when we were hired was right after Columbia, and we were told we might not ever fly in space, let alone we probably would not fly on the shuttle. And the cool thing is, the um, head of our office made sure that just about every single one of us has flown on shuttle. With the exception, Shannon Walker, who's in the upper top left, um, first Houstonian astronaut, she's up there right now in the International Space Station. She went on the Soyuz. 
but she got a six month stay, so it's not too bad of a deal. And um, Satoshi Furukawa, who comes from the Japanese Space Agency, they're the only two that will have not flown on the shuttle. The rest of us all got to fly on the shuttle before it retires this next year. So sometimes, even when people tell you you can't do things, like literally hire you telling you you won't be doing it, you can still do things. So again, telling your students, you can do it. Even when everything is stacked against you or, that's, or the funding isn't there, there's sometimes surprising ways that you can do it. So what does it mean to train as an astronaut? Because, again, why could a teacher become an astronaut? Well, because we have a lot of good skills and because flying in space is becoming a part of um, what more of us are able to do just because of the skills that we develop along the way. So first of all, you have to look like an astronaut, you know. So we had to get the flight suit. And then we went off to several survival schools, including ground and water survival, because we do fly in the T-38 jet across the ocean and across land, and just hopefully never in the case that we'll ever need it, but just in case they wanted us to be prepared. So we went off and uh, practiced all of our fire building skills and, and uh, mapping and all of these things that most of us had a background in, but it was the teamwork that was the more important part and relying on each other because we all are experts in everything. And then, of course, we run a lot of scenarios and it's through the scenarios that you learn and that you grow. Just like your students, it's in the laboratory that they'll probably, or in the hands-on experience, do the most learning because you make mistakes and because you have to learn from those mistakes and because you get to try the equipment, all of these things. So it's really important to keep doing those hands-on. Um, so anyway, the scenario was we were in groups of three. We were dropped off all around this wilderness in Maine and then we had to meet up at a rock at a certain time. Well, we all navigated and we met up at this big rock and then um, they told us that the helicopter that was supposed to rescue us, we really weren't going to have a helicopter res rescue us, but that it wasn't able to come in, so we were going to have to stay there overnight. No problem. We had just spent the whole time learning how to build fires in five minutes. We had meals ready to eat in our packs. And we had a half of a parachute between the three, each group of three of us, so we could build a shelter. And we had become pretty good at building these shelters. So we made these really nice tents and we talked, in fact, we actually looked at the stars because we didn't have anything else to do that night. We told stories around the campfire. We go off to bed and at five in the morning, we hear these really loud whistle blows. Well, it turns out it's still part of more of the scenario. They've injured two of our teammates. Of course, they've injured the Navy SEAL and the Army um, helicopter pilot, the two biggest and uh, probably most adept guys on our our class, but we ended up building stretchers, um, getting everyone's equipment, and getting everyone out of the, the forest in two hours. Maybe not ideal, and here's where that learning and learning from your mistakes comes in. We probably wanted to do it in about an hour, or maybe an hour and a half, so how could we have been more quick, and how could we have maybe been more efficient as a team? And that's what you guys will ask your students at the end of their labs, or at the end of the year, you know, what have you learned? How can you become better? Because they need to know what skills they have, and they need to know where they're going to get better. Well, water survival, uh, again, more excitement. Now we were in Pensacola, and this is probably my least favorite day of the whole job. I was a swimmer in high school. I don't mind the water. In fact, I really love being in it when it's this time of year and it's so hot. But I do not like being <laughs> drugged and dunked and, and um, forced underwater. And in this scenario, we were in the swimming pool and turned over and we had to get out. And we had to do this three times. The first time you could get out any door or window. The second time you had to get out the window that they assigned you to. And the third time you had to do it blindfold. And um, it was really uncomfortable. Actually, the easiest was to do it blindfolded because you made a mental map in your head and you weren't disoriented with all the bubbles and everything else. And that surprised me. But uh, least favorite day on the job. Um, some of my most favorite days on the job are flying. 
I love being up in the air, and I didn't come from a flying background, so it's really exciting for me to be out there above the earth and navigating and kind of free in a way. We started out in Pensacola on the T-34 because that's what the Navy used at the time to train their pilots before moving on to the T-38. The T-38 is fast. We can go up to um, the speed of sound out over the ocean, and uh, we don't usually do that, but we can. And we use these all over. We take them down to the Cape to get us um, to, to our launch site quickly. We do formation, which is really fun. We do aerobatics, all sorts of great things. So the T-38 is also where we develop team skills because I'm never going to be the front pilot. I don't have that training. But I'm the backseater that can run all of the navigation, and I can talk to the ground, and I can fly the jet. In fact, as soon as we're 400 feet above the ground on takeoff, I can take over everything. And often I try to do this because it really uses all of my uh, multitasking skills, and it builds a really good scan pattern that I can use as a robotics operator on the shuttle. So I, I do this to challenge myself, but it's also a good way to build teamwork. You don't need to do it all by yourself. And so we split skills. One person will fly, the other person will navigate and communicate. And you have to know when you're sw swapping the job back, right? You want to know the other person has a plane. So you push the stick and let them know, okay, you've got it now. And uh, it really builds up teamwork in an environment that is... Um, dangerous. I mean, you know, you have to be on top of it all the time. Now, the folks that are our front seaters are obviously very talented, and that's why they came to the astronaut office. So um, we're, it's not a super dangerous job, but it is at, at times there are critical points where you could make a mistake, and so we want to be on top of that and way ahead of it. There's times it's just fun, and as you know in your classroom, you can make it just fun for kids, and that's okay. We all need a break. We all need a way to relax and be in that environment. And uh, the KC-135 was our um, first experience of prolonged zero-G before going to space. So we did flips, and we just had a ball. We flew like Superman. We just had a really, really good time. And then this would carry on, of course, to zero G in space. And we go to class too. Only our class in school looks a little bit different than the classrooms that you're working and teaching in. But we have mock-ups of all of the equipment that we will use. We have simulators that have the avionics, so all the computer support that works just like the shuttle and the space station. And then we also have these types of classrooms where they're not hooked up to the avionics, but they are like the actual volume size. And you kind of get an idea of what you're going to be living in and how you're going to have to manage your equipment and gear. Because space is um, all about managing things. So uh, we also get a chance to still do geology. This is where we have the home to the lunar rock samples, as well as a big collection of meteorites. And as a geologist, of course, I was very interested in all of this. We also have a virtual reality lab where we can integrate robotics and um, the spacewalkers. So the spacewalkers put on these helmets and these gloves, and they look into what looks just like the space station, and they can practice their spacewalk. Meanwhile, I can be on the controls of the robotic arm, and on my displays, it looks like they're doing the spacewalk. And we spend hours doing this before we, of course, go fly and then carry out the three spacewalks that we did on the mission I was on. Spacesuit that's used for spacewalks. It weighs 350 pounds um, to, with a crew member inside of it, it's almost like 600 pounds of um, mass. Well, you can imagine that's going to behave a lot differently in space than here on Earth. And on Earth, you're not going to go walking around with a 600 pound spacesuit on. So we train in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is a large swimming pool that has a fully um, full-size space station mock-up in it. And for every one spacewalk that we're going to do in space, which usually a spacewalk is six and a half to seven hours, we train that seven times in the pool. 
That's a lot of time in the pool. But that's to um, make it efficient. That's to work on our communication skills between, I was the person inside talking to the two men outside during the whole space flight. And so that was to gain that communication. And then just, we had a lot of things go wrong. Um, and they weren't horrible things, and we could work on real time, but, but things do go wrong. Bolts um, behave differently in space because of the heating. You know, you, they're seeing temperature extremes of plus 275 degrees to minus uh, 100 and some degrees. So they're just seeing these huge temperature ranges every 45 minutes. Well, you can imagine over years and years of cycling like this that they don't behave like they would on Earth. And we ran into that problem which changed two of our spacewalks almost completely. And so you have to be able to have the confidence and know that you can change that real time. And that all comes from the people that taught us. We have teachers for the astronauts too. We eat lunch, I threw this in here because kids always like to know that <laughs> they know, they like to see you sometimes when you're shopping out in the grocery store or you know, out at the mall. Well, astronauts eat and use the bathroom too, just like their teachers. <laughs> and here, we're um, learning about how you make food. This is one of our early classes back five years ago. How do you make lunch or dinner? Well, as you can see, our pantry looks a lot different than at home. Everything has to have a net over it so it doesn't go, f when you open the drawer, and everything doesn't go flying out. Because trust me, when the jelly bellies go flying out, it's a really big pain in the butt to clean them up. So, um, not that that's happened to anyone in here, um, but there's our pantry and our rehydrating and reheating um, device is this kind of oven and water um, provider. So we're able to add two to eight ounces to any food that needs to be rehydrated and then we can um, heat it in the oven and leave it in there or we can use hot water itself and just leave it out. Um, but we're all about being green on the shuttle also because we're wasting cryo if we don't. And so most of us just chose to use cold water and then put it into the oven because the oven, once you heat it, it stays hot and you can turn it off. And so that was pretty handy and uh, it saved us enough cryo because we ended up extending our mission from 13 days to 15 days and all the cryo savings um, helps out there. We have simulators. This one is a motion simulator that goes, um, it's like the flight cockpit of the shuttle, and it starts out when we tilt back to 60 degrees. Normally we launch, of course, in the 90 degree position. But this way you get that motion component while you're trying to execute all these procedures. And we'll spend four hours in there at a time um, practicing multiple launches and for every launch you hope there's a landing. So we practice all these launches and landings over and over. We do scuba diving in the neutral buoyancy lab. We did geology training out in Air, um, New Mexico. And we looked at extreme environments. You know, especially when I go out and talk to elementary students, they always want to ask me, are there aliens? <laughs> Do they have little green men in space? And I always have to answer, well, I don't think that there are little green men in space, but I do believe that there's probably some other life form out there and that lives in an extreme environment. The environment we were looking at here on Earth is very acidic um, hot springs. It's not even the hottest places that we see here on Earth where there is life, but it was just an extreme acidic environment in New Mexico. We see life living in really cold environments, on the bottom of the ocean, in places where we didn't think there could be life. So yes, I think that there probably is, and as we continue to pull more information from Mars, um, that we will see that there is more possibility for life beyond Earth. We went to Na National Outdoor Leadership School in Wyoming, and we ran a course for two weeks where you're backpacking and you're learning how to take care of yourself so that you can take care of the people that you're living with. And then we wait to be assigned to a mission. And I was fortunate to be assigned to this crew, STS-131. Um, they're just a really great group of people from all different backgrounds. We had a Navy commander, an Air Force pilot, 
um, an electrical engineer who sat next to me. I was the flight engineer, a high school teacher with a geology background. Um, Stephanie Wilson came to us from Harvard. Um, she's a great role model for women and minorities. Uh, Naoko Yamazaki from the Japanese Space Agency, also another great role model. She's the second Japanese woman to fly in space. There she is right there. And Clay Anderson from um, Nebraska. So on our 15-day mission, our job was to, of course, fly to the International Space Station, dock with it. We brought six tons of equipment in a basic little U-Haul in the back of our shuttle. Um, we needed to transfer all of that equipment, which is a lot easier in space than it is on Earth, because you can just carry a whole bunch of weight between your legs and float around with it. Um, and then we had three spacewalks, and each spacewalk needed to have robotic support. And so we were, those were really detailed days that we had practiced many times. And then we undocked and we came home. So here, some of the things that amazed me about space was just the beauty, the sheer beauty of the Earth and, and the extreme environments. I have been many places, but I've never been to all of these places around the world. Here's our docking and joining up um, with, there's 13 people in space from Japan, from Russia, and from the United States. First time four women were in space. Here, um, Stephanie and Naoko are getting ready at the robotics workstation to um, remove the multi-purpose logistics module, or that big U-Haul, and dock it to the space station. Once they got the hatch open, then there's all that equipment that we needed to move. So you have to be strategic about it because there isn't a lot of space on space station. So you have to grab bags from there and put and transfer bags in. And then equally, the spacewalks that we do outside, we were dealing with equipment that's 2,000 pounds. But this equipment was 900, some of the racks that Naoko was moving. We have to use multiple types of tools. So again, like I said, get your students to use lots of tools from the beginning. See how easy it is to move things? <laughs> and it takes teamwork. And so I know sometimes it makes it harder to do team projects, um, having had to degrade them and to figure out how the work has been loaded across your students. But team projects are important because there isn't a time in our life that we're not really working as a team. So keep doing them. And I know it'll be difficult to grade. <laughs> Here I set up where I talked to the spacewalkers. Um, I was in the shuttle and I basically had like six different books. Now normally you would put six different books around you on desktops, but this way I could just kind of hang them, Velcro them different places, and keep an eye on them the whole time, which is much different than our training on Earth. So it was really a lot easier to talk to them in space, because I could actually watch them for a good chunk of the time. And here they are in those spaces I talked about. At all times, you can see they're on a tether. It's a lot like a long dog leash. And uh, that's their safety tether back to the space station. And my job is to always make sure that that is locked and that they are safe. Stephanie and Jim were the robotic arm operators. So if you look really closely, there's two spacewalkers in that video, and, or in that picture, and that arm is moving this 2,000 pound tank. So you can imagine the type of practice that we had done and the type of communication. Again, these are critical skills that your students need to, to keep working on. And sometimes it's just gorgeous. I was really proud of that photo because I took it of, of the guys out there and it, it got put onto a magazine cover, just a, just a work magazine cover, nothing like big, but I was proud that I'm not a photographer and so I developed a skill during all of this. Well, this was the whole um, suit up team and then there's our crew. At night we would tell the, the ground about what we'd been doing during the day. We'd show them some video and they have live video the whole time, but we'd kind of talk about what we'd been up to. 
Of course, working out is important, um, especially to the folks on space station, but equally important to the commander and pilot. Because after 15 days in space, you've lost a significant amount of blood volume, and you have also, um, your, your brain has told itself, I don't need my heart to work as hard to get blood to, to my brain anymore. Well, when we enter back to the 1G of Earth, you need your heart to send that blood to the pilot and commander so they can land. And so we had them work out because you can use your lower leg muscles as well as the G suit that we wear to help keep blood in your brain. We were there just after the cupola had been brought up and that window is magnificent. Um, I could spend hours in there because the earth is changing all the time. And uh, we got great photos and videos auroras. I'd never seen the aurora before, even though I've lived in the Pacific Northwest. And then we had to put the ammonia tank, the old one that had failed, back into our bay and uh, come home. So we had, and we even brought home old failed equipment. So I think we brought home 2,000 pounds um, and we had delivered six tons. There's the full diversity spectrum there. And then this is, the, again, the robotic operations. Um, Alek Kotov and Alan Poindexter were the two commanders, so they're, they're changing command there, or sh saying goodbye to command. We put, hung our patch up on a wall that preserves the history, and then we are ready for undocking. So it's very bright during undocking. You have to be um, looking at the station the whole time. And our pilot flies the undocking. So the commander flies the docking, and the undocking is done by the pilot. And then we take a lap around the whole station, taking pictures. This is sometimes when we find if anything is out of place or if there's been any damage. It also just gives us a, a good appreciation of this amazing piece of equipment we, we've been building for 10 years in space. And then we get ready to come home. And it's a lot harder to put on those orange pumpkin suits in space than it is on Earth. Um, boots are trying to, you know, you're trying to pull something on while moving, and it's just not that easy. But once we landed, um, given about an hour of getting some fluids and just kind of resting, we do a walk around, we check out the vehicle, and we enjoy being home on Earth. And then a day later, we come back to Ellington Field in Houston to see all of the people, again, that, who have taught us and influenced us over the time. So I'm going to end there and open it up for questions. So I'd like to ask you guys to be students at this point and ask me a bunch of questions. How long did it take to, for me to readapt to Earth? Well, I had this idea that I was gonna be the superhero and not be sick at all. And anytime you think that you're gonna be a superhero, you're not. So <laughs> immediately upon landing, we do a water, um, we drink a, about, two liters of water in the 40 minutes before we do our burn and before coming back to Earth, and that is to help with this blood volume loss. Well, just like sometimes it happens when I'm running a marathon, that quantity of water in such a short amount of time hit the stomach and came right back up upon landing. But the good thing was, like, I just used my parenting skills and my running skills at that point, and I was like, well, that happened, but we still have switches to throw. We have about 40 more minutes that we're in the vehicle before they come and get us out. And I am not gonna not throw my switches that I've been training for. So cleaned that out of the way and just got back to throwing switches. And that was about, you know, and that doesn't happen to everyone, but I wasn't the only one that got sick, I will say. Um, but it, it, and it tends to happen more so to rookies and non-pilots, because pilots have been in a lot of G attitudes prior in their training. but. Um, it was uh, about a whole day before you start to feel really good. And it was, I ran three days after landing. They don't necessarily recommend that, but, but I knew that I wasn't gonna run like all out. And part of like something that keeps me going is running. And so I was running, but I was running really slow. You don't make a lot of sharp turns just because your body isn't quite ready to 
adapt to those sharp turns. And, uh, but I, that evening, I had dinner with my family on the beach. My daughter's three and a half, so I was picking her up. You know, she's not gonna understand that mommy can't do something. So you, you start to recover pretty quickly. But the blood volume, and especially to me as an athlete, was the most noticeable. I mean, that takes like two weeks to really completely recover you know, to get your iron counts and everything back to where they were in your oxygen. How close is the simulation in the water to the feeling in space? You know, it is very close in some aspects in that the tools work the exact same way, the distance, um, the uh, different part is that you still have gravity with you, so it's harder in the pool to like get up upside down and work at a work site because you're still putting a lot of pressure on your shoulders. In fact, we have a safety rule that you can only do it for 10 minutes because we get shoulder injuries in a lot of our astronauts just the way the suit was designed. It's not shoulder friendly and also, of course, your blood is rushing to your head and we don't want astronauts to pass out in the water. That would be equally bad. Another thing that we notice is that in space, you are constantly moving your hands to uh, um, adjust that suit. Like any little motion, of course, is gonna be a motion and you're gonna have to keep correcting. In the water, the water drag dampens out all that motion. So the water can kind of do two things to you. It can make it harder to translate because you're constantly having to fight across the drag. So you, that's why we work out a lot is because to do these seven hour runs in the pool, you've gotta be in good shape. Once you get to space, it's not that hard to move. In fact, now you're spending all your time doing these little fine tuning with your hands and forearms. So again, that's why we work those out on Earth is so they'll be strong when you get to space. Um, the other thing that's not there is that night and day cycle. Night and day um, not only affects what you're gonna be able to see, it can, um, disrupt your orientation, especially for first time spacewalkers often say, where am I? You know, I knew where I was. And if you can think about where you would be in the pool, it's helpful. But when it's dark and you're suddenly looking at a dark earth and dark space, it's very disorienting and it can be a little spooky um, if you're not holding on tight. So that part and then also again that heat cycle uh, we have heaters on our gloves we have a cooling system of a series of tubes that goes through um, long underwear basically and keeps you cool in the sunshine and then it, it warms you up in the darkness um, but you have to stay on that well in the pool there's um, people that control all the heating for us so there's just, there's gonna be differences and similarities, but it's enough similar to, to make it a very valuable training place. And I'd say it's one of the most valuable places that we train. Yeah. Um, my fifth grader sent um, a list of questions, All right. so I'll ask two. One of them is, do you recycle or let loose any trash in space at all? And another one is we're studying place value in math. They wanted to know how much each how much each mission cost in terms of dollars. All right, these are good questions. See, I tell you, the kids ask really good questions. Well, first of all, the trash is a very important question because um, yes, we we recycle some things, and uh, the only things that get sent overboard is urine waste. And then all of the trash from space station gets sent overboard in a progress, which will burn up in the atmosphere. So it gets sent back, but it doesn't um, end up making you know, space junk that we have to avoid. So obviously it gets put back into the atmosphere, which um, I'm not sure exactly what, how bad that is to have all that stuff burning up. I'm assuming it's not too big of a footprint, but. Um, so it becomes, waste is something that you really monitor when you're up there. Um, you know, every little piece of food that we eat, of course, is in a wrapper to keep it contained so we can inject the water or so that it keeps it clean or whatever. Well, then you, now you have to make a decision between, is this wet trash or dry trash? Wet trash for the shuttle astronaut um, means that it needs to go into a compartment that gets vented so that we don't get this huge smelly compartment that's making us all sick. Um, 
Dry trash is easy. I mean, it's like paper, you know, sticky notes, because we use sticky notes for things. But like um, a peanut wrapper can sometimes go into a dry trash if it doesn't have much residue on it. So it's really funny, like you'll, you'll be, hmm, what type of trash is this? Especially for the new astronauts in the beginning, I would find myself asking, can I put this in dry trash or does this need to go in wet trash? You know, what's the rule? Um, because some things are not so obvious. But you really want, again, to conserve space. So um, every day our dry trash bin, uh, we would wrap it up really tight, gray tape it, and then um, cram it into another compartment. And uh, for space station, it is crucial to not have a lot of waste. And so they don't use nearly as much printed paper. Like the shuttle uses a lot of printed paper. Um, all of our checklists are on printed paper. They do it on a computer screen with PDFs that they're reading and hyperlinks. Um, and then uh, they just, you know, they just manage it the best they can. For the other question on mission costs, um, <laughs> it really actually depends on how you decide to look at it. And so they have it broken down on our website, and I just never memorize, I just don't memorize the numbers because it, it depends on what you want to look at. But um, it can be looked at as the total cost of all the training of the astronauts, all of the time that you're paying the people and the technicians to build up the shuttle before it launches, the, sh the equipment costs itself, et cetera, or you could just look at how much does it cost to launch that, and that's all on the NASA website. So we'll send them there to do some research. Yes? Um, I would like to ask, what is the future of uh, the space program and um, NASA in general? Because I know that they have cut costs like everywhere. I mean, we know that we're like under a global crisis, economical, so. Right. I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about that. Right. So as you know, um, at the end of, uh, well, actually, it's going to be now in the, to the middle of next year, but we have two more shuttles that are, are going to be flying, and that's in November. On November 1st, we have SCS-133 that will fly to the space station, and it's um, delivering a permanent module. It's taking that same type of MPLM, that little U-Haul I talked about that we had in the back of our shuttle, and it's going to leave it there as a permanent module, which means it's taking up a lot of equipment, including um, a robot. So it's kind of an interesting, very cool flight. And then there's STS-134 that will fly in February, and that's bringing up um, the um, astrophysics uh, experiment that will be out on the the space station and, and learning about dark matter. Those are the last two shuttle flights that are scheduled at this point. And, um, that, and that's an end of a huge era. Like I talked about at the beginning, I mean, the shuttle was the only vehicle I knew. Um, I wasn't like my parents who got to see Apollo and things like that. So we're changing our philosophy and going to low Earth. I mean, we've had the space station flying um, for 10 years, but we're going now to continuing out the space station for another 10 years to 2020 with our international partners. And it is a science laboratory. So it is um, a phenomenal place to do a lot of research. And while the last 10 years we've been building and equipping it, now the next 10 years, the goal is to just gain a lot of science research from it because um, because there will be six astronauts on board, or, or three astronauts, three cosmonauts, and um, there's just so much to be done. In the meantime, um, you've heard about commercial companies who are building vehicles um, like SpaceX, and, um, and these companies are, are trying to first learn if they can equip the station, so first no manned missions, and then maybe they are going to look at doing manned missions as well. And then really we're looking to um, the budget that's being decided in November, but for the time being it looks like um, the goal is going to be going to asteroids or um, deeper space for NASA and leaving the commercial companies to pick up uh, transfer to and from the space station. So it's a little bit in um, flux at the moment, but I think we'll start to see um, it hammered out in November. What type of diet do you maintain in space? 
Ah, diet. It's actually very, um, well, it's, it's calculated by our nutritionist. It's probably more calories than I would ever eat. Like, I had a hard time coming close to eating as much of the food that was sent for me. But um, the big important thing when you're in space is make sure you drink a lot of liquids because a lot of the foods that we have have salt or um, some preservatives or things like that. And especially for the long duration folks that are up there for five to six months, if you have all those salts and things um, going through your system without enough fluids, you can develop kidney stones. That would not be a pretty situation on board the International Space Station. So lots of fluids. I found myself always thirsty. It's also a dry environment because um, everything is cooled by the air around you, so it's pretty dry. And, uh, and then the rest is just um, basically all the different types of foods that you can have here on Earth that have either been dehydrated and needs to be rehydrated or have been preserved in a way like a meal ready to eat where you just need to reheat it um, but it's been stabilized so that, that microbes won't grow in it. Um, I tried to make sure I ate like a very balanced vegetable, carbohydrate, protein diet, but um, you can have some junk food up there too, and we eat peanuts, or peanut M&Ms too, so that's pretty good. Yes, yeah, so if someone had to return because of a medical issue, um, first of all, uh, I had the opportunity to get some medical training um, for like, rapid emergency response, like if someone really hurt themselves and had a bl blood coming out, you know, we needed, or a breathing event. So we went and did medical training with a hospital in Houston and actually, you know, learned how to put IVs in and I put IVs in real patients and things like this. And um, um, so we have that type of emergency response. And then we have, okay, if we needed, if we could get this person stabilized, can we get them back to Earth within like a half a day type of measure? And so the Soyuz is the return vehicle for the International Space Station. And for a shuttle, we can undock and return to Earth in roughly four hours, but really it would be more like a five or six hour event. But, but there are runways around the world that could accommodate a shuttle, and we practice this in sims, like if you had to do an emergency undock. Um, but thankfully, we have not had to. I think if I'm understanding right, like how do you leave or dock things in space? Um, do you mean the vehicles or like the equipment? Okay, for instance, the equipment is all behind different types of Velcro panels or um, hard panels. And so it's just like a little thumb screw and you can open up a shelf and then um, kind of like Martha Stewart, there's those soft-sided um, stowage that you might put your shoes in or different things, and you can shove these bags in. And we, we stow things in what we call crew transfer bags, which are basically um, maybe two feet by two feet by a foot um, of a volume in a quilted bag. And then the stuff in there is also within bags, like Ziploc bags or, you know, so you start to have bags within bags within a within a container. And the whole, um, all of the, let's see, the, pretty much the whole Columbus and parts of the Japanese module and a good portion of the lab are all of these um, stowage areas. And they can be above, they're above you and below you and beside you. So you have to have a coding system to know which one you're going to. I mean, after a while, you know, living there, you, you start to know where things are, just like in your own house. But when you first get there, there's a numbering system and labeling system that we use that we get trained on so that we know how to find things and get, get them and then to stow them. But Velcro and thumb screws and all these things are really helpful in keeping things stowed for long periods of time. Oh, and what holds all of that is, um, we call it a rack. And a rack, and these are all built differently, but it's kind of the size of a closet. And, and um, it's built, it, it goes into the structure of the, the module. So there's like um, guide, guiding posts that you guide it into and then it stays put and it's bolted in, so it becomes a part of the hard module. Could you leave us with one last uh, information or tip about how, as teachers, 
we need to be very cognizant in working with our students of how can we continue to inspire our students to take the route you did. What, are kinds, what kinds of things can we continue to do? And I did note that you really emphasize teamwork. And of course, teachers, all of you know, the only way that I know how to emphasize teamwork is for me to be a team member myself. I can't, you know, I can't stand up there on the stage and, and be aloof and expect you all to say, you know, Mr. Rent's not a learner. We all have to be learners, and that's one thing I picked up about you, is that you are absolutely a learner. So as you close us out, would you just give us, as teachers, what can we go back and make sure that we, we really instill in our students? I think the biggest thing, and you're doing it right now, is that you always are one, like you said, a continuous learner, and that you care about your students. And you're not going to connect with every single student in your class, even though I know you'll try but just because of all of our different personalities, you may not be that favorite teacher for every single student, but as long as you try and you keep making that effort every day, and like I said, with a student who even asked me, how do you go to the bathroom in space? It was not one of my favorite students, but it was a student who I really wanted to see become successful. And, um, and I hope that she is. I don't know the end story. I do know in the time that I was there, she did not graduate from high school. But that doesn't mean that she didn't go on and do something later and that she didn't go on to a recovery credit program or whatever it is. And so every day, find it within you to forgive what happened in the past days with that student. And every day, try to make connections with your student because you guys are great role models. I mean, like I said, my parents, both being teachers, of course, were not going to uh, let anything, um, let my sister or I not become successful, I think. But um, it was all my other teachers that were just equally as important. And I could list, I remember all of my teachers. So <laughs> I could list all of them off. So that was what I would leave you with. Thanks so much. You guys are really fun to talk with. Thank you. Thank you.